Well, as part of the historical committee's uh, effort to talk to the truly great, great Democrats that Polk County has been blessed with in the past 50 years, uh, we have today a chance to talk with uh, Roxanne Conlon, who again is one of my heroes and a hero of a number of Democrats here in Polk County. So it's a real honor to have a chance to talk to you today, Roxanne. Oh. When did you first become interested in politics? I became interested in politics in 1960. Jack Kennedy was running for president, and I, I thought he ought to be the president. And so I called headquarters. Now, I don't know if it's Polk County headquarters or the Iowa headquarters, but I just called. I was 16 years old, and I called and said I wanted to help. And plenty to do. It must have been in September or October because we were walking, we were walking decks, uh, making phone calls. Uh, on Saturdays we'd go out to Merle Hay Mall and put bumper stickers on cars, sometimes whether they wanted them or not. <laughs> uh, and, and then on election day I was the head of the Polk County babysitting pool. When, when uh, people, this is before people took their children everywhere, and they uh, would call and ask for a babysitter, and we would send somebody out to watch their kids for a couple of hours while they went to go vote. But I loved it, and when Jack Kennedy won, I thought I'd done it. I thought my babysitting pool elected the man president of the United States of America, and I was hooked. And uh, I haven't left it since. Did you have a chance to see Jack Kennedy personally? N uh, never. Uh, he's, he is the uh, only president only Democratic president that I didn't ever see. Now, you're Catholic, right? Yes. Well, what was the uh, kind of the feeling within the Catholic Church in 1960 when he was running? Did you pick up anything? There oh, yes. I, one of the reasons I think that I wanted him to be president was because he was Catholic and because that would be so groundbreaking to have him elected. And um, I was at St. Joseph's Academy in all-girls school here, here in Des Moines, and uh, he was very widely beloved in the, in the school. Well, I know you've been active in the Democratic Party politics throughout the entire history. I could take you probably election by election to find out what <laughs> you're up to. That's what we but, just did, yes. Yeah. Uh, 1962, did you get involved in Hughes' campaign at all? Yes, yes. Um, and I, uh, I, you know, there was, a, there was a Hughes election, I think it was 64, where he was running against Evan Haltman. Do you remember that at all? Yes. Or, uh, and, and they had... Um, a debate over the noon hour, and Evan Haltman accused Governor Hughes of uh, drinking. And he was, of course, an alcoholic. He said he hadn't uh, been drinking for many, many years, and uh, there was no proof or anything like that. And uh, because he Evan Haltman did that, and it was considered very dirty politics, I was in headquarters and the call started rolling in from people who were so offended by what Evan Holtman said. Um, they were changing their votes, they were going to vote for Hughes. It, it created a landslide for Hughes. And I was the head of the Young Democrats at the time, of the Polk County Young Democrats. And so we had a telephone tree where I would call 10 people and they would call 10 people who would call 10 people and, you know, no answering machines. And you know you could actually reach people on the telephone, and uh, and you know overnight we could put three or four hundred people on the street. It was a very valuable resource for all the campaigns in 1964. Uh, when did you become a lawyer? I became a, I graduated from law school in 1966. Okay, so you weren't old enough to go to work for Scalise at that time. No, I went to work as a law clerk. However, when I got fired from my job, I, be, I became a law clerk to the uh, Attorney General of Iowa. I, I had been working for a private law firm and I got pregnant. Oh. And they fired me. Wow. And, and, and then he put me, he put me with a, 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 an older bachelor who, and I was hugely pregnant. And it, uh, walking up and down the steps, the guy escorted me up and down the steps. <laughs> but Larry Scalise is, is one of my heroes. Uh, he was a very fair and generous man. Roxanne, this doesn't have to do directly with politics, but as a lawyer, one of the things I admired was the speed at which you got your education. <laughs> cool. Why don't you just share with us a little bit about you know the timing of that, how long it took you to get through undergrad and law school? 
Well, I started, I started in undergraduate school when I was 16. I skipped my senior year of high school and went directly to college. And, uh, and, uh, and then I graduated in three years from college. And, and uh, I did my last year of college and my first year of law school at the same time. So I was 21 when I became a lawyer. That's amazing. I don't know of anybody that that's, was younger than you when they graduated from law school. Well, you, you had to be 21 to take the bar. So I didn't have any choice. I, put, I could have done it faster, I think. <laughs> you eventually went to the Attorney General's office, right? Yes. I worked for the Republican Attorney General for many, many, many years. Um, it was not a good fit, but we did like each other very much. And uh, before I took the job, I talked to Dick Pinnaker. And he said, oh, don't worry, everyone will understand. And then he died. And so I didn't really have the protection or the buffer that I expected to have, having, having taken that job. But I was the head of the Iowa Civil Rights Division of the Iowa Department of Justice. And so I had an opportunity to do important civil rights work from that office. As a Republican, did Turner give you the right to be autonomous? He did. Um, he, he was uh, quite amazing in that respect. He once said to me, you know, if somebody from the legislature is not down here in this office demanding your immediate resignation, I know you're out of town. <laughs> well, I told you that I interned uh, up at the state capitol in 1976 for Bob Tyson through a program at Drake University. And uh, there was a time that he was going to have an appointment with you and you were supposed to come over, and I didn't know you from Adam at that point, and Tice uh, said that, uh, he told me about you, and he said, she's a Democrat, but she's a terrific lawyer, and I love working with her. Okay, so in 1976, were you involved in the election at all? Yes. Or Jimmy Carter? Yes, yeah. I, you know, I did, for many years, I did lots of the, the work of a regular party volunteer, the phone calls, the door knocking, uh, you know, whatever needed to be done. And, uh, Right after the 1976 election, you decided to seek a different office. Is that right? Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Who were the competitors for that position at U.S. Uh, Attorney? Do you have any interesting stories from that process? Well, yes, I have. Um, it, it was a merit selection process. The Democratic senator set up a board to interview all the applicants, and there were a bunch of applicants, many with a lot more political pull than I than I had, and uh, uh, and the. I'll never forget my interview. Lee Godinier was on the panel, and I remember him, and I remember Mr. Mr. Greer, uh, Joel Greer's father, uh -huh. and he, his name is John, and uh, it, it was, I was 33 years old, and I had been an assistant attorney general for many years, but uh, it, it, there was some tension in the room, and when uh, at, at one point, John Greer asked me what my husband thought of me becoming the United States Attorney. And I always thought I handled it very well. I did not lose my temper. Um, I, I said, well, if you want to know what he thinks, then you're going to have to call him. I have his number. Now, at that time, we had two Democratic senators uh -huh. who had set the panel. Is that That's right? That's correct. That's correct. And did both of them uh, just send over one nominee to the president? No. Um, you know, I, I believe Frank Comito was one of the nominees, and Roger Olson, and uh, uh, Jimmy Carter selected uh, me for the position. But it was, not, uh, it was not a popular selection with the law enforcement community. And the FBI conducted something in the neighborhood of 200 interviews in an effort to find something that would disqualify me from the job. That's amazing because I, I think your term in office was really well regarded. It was well regarded, but first I had to get there. Right. And they were so suspicious. Uh, they started, in fact, I think this is in the paper someplace, there was a rumor that if I became the United States Attorney that uh, the Mafia would make Des Moines their international headquarters. You know, so <laughs> you know, you do move in interesting circles. Well, the U.S. <laughs> That's the, right. <laughs> the U.S. District Attorney currently has a staff of about 40 lawyers, and it tends to be more of an administrative post. It was much different when you were in charge, five, right? I had five assistants, and I tried a case a month, at least a case a month, myself. And I took the harder cases for myself, the more challenging cases. I took. I tried the general May case myself. Uh, I tried a lot of white-collar crime cases, and 
and uh, it wasn't there wasn't much administration to be done because there were just five assistants. Was there a particular thing that you're proud of with regard to that four years? Did you did you take on a particular line of cases that you really wanted to see prosecuted? Well, I did. I you know the emphasis of the Carter administration was on white collar crime, and uh, so I did a lot of white collar crime, a lot of fraud. Uh, and things like that. But I was proud of the General May case. Um, it was a very difficult case to try and a very difficult case to investigate. And, uh, but I just did not think that you should commandeer jet airplanes flown by National Guard pilots to visit your girlfriend. I didn't think that was good. So what did you do once you left uh, office as U.S. District Attorney? I ran for governor of the state of Iowa. Almost immediately? Yes. Okay. I, I resigned uh, in August and you know, started running at that time. How long was your campaign? Well, uh, in fact, I had started before I left the office. Um, it, it was a, you know, from, from, it was formal from August on. Okay, so you had probably about six or seven months, or eight or nine months before the primary mm -hmm. you were out working. Mm -hmm. Who were your opponents in the primary? Ed Campbell and Jerry Fitzgerald. Two good candidates. Wonderful candidates, and uh, it was a it was a heck of a race. What do you think made the difference in the primary that resulted in your nomination? Well, I think that the whole idea of a woman running was so bizarre, and of uh, you know even at, you know at that time people knew that no woman had ever been elected in Iowa, but it wasn't quite as stunning as it is today, but, uh, you know, I think that I won the primary because I was a woman. Now, after the primary was over... And I lost the general because I was well, a woman. We're talk about <laughs> we could spend an hour just talking about that race alone because I think that was such a, you know, a landmark uh, election, win or lose. It was phenomenal. You made history. But uh, with regard to the general election, I wanted to ask you a few questions about some things that occurred during the general election. First of all, you gave a, a, a very... Uh, well-covered speech at the convention, the state convention, immediately after you're nominated. Do you remember any? Uh, do you remember the press coverage on that? Yes, um, it was. It was. You know, uh, the the press coverage was excellent to start with, but they thought I had declared class warfare. Even then, in 1982, the issue of class warfare was one that the Republicans trotted out any time they could. And so they thought I had declared class warfare. And, uh, and, and then as, as a result of our tax situation, that became, it became that I was hypocritical. Even though, no one ever heard me say this, even though I favored changes in Iowa tax law that would have disadvantaged my family. With regard to uh, right after the speech, I remember that the Republicans picked Governor Ray to lead the attack on the Republican side. Mm -hmm. Was he a surrogate during most of the campaign for Brainstead? He was. He was. So he, that wasn't the only time he uh, would uh, take you on, so no, to speak. No. Is that right? Yeah. He, he, was a, he was a surrogate for Republicans. He was also, of course, governor, sitting governor, and Brainstead was a sitting lieutenant governor at the time. One of the, the key things that Brands had wanted you to do was to disclose your income tax returns. Yes, yes. Why did you finally agree to do that? I didn't. Okay. I never disclosed my income tax returns because at the time, my husband was involved in a lot of partnerships. And so by disclosing my own uh, tax returns, and I filed jointly with him, uh, which was something that never occurred to me I should perhaps not be doing, but we filed jointly, and as a result of the partnerships, I would have been disclosing other people's incomes. Which wouldn't have been appropriate, is that no, right? No, I did not think it was. But you disclosed something with regard to your taxes. I disclosed how much I paid. Yeah. And that, and that was something that was important to Branstead because then he tried to make a yes. big issue of that. Is and that right? he did. You know, it was a very successful effort. Uh, how many debates with Branstead? I don't remember. At least three. At least three. Anything that comes to mind about those debates that was pivotal? I won them all. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> Do you think that the fact that everybody expects you to win actually hurts you a little bit? Yes, it, you know, it is all a game of expectations. And I, I just, you know, it doesn't do to rail against the expectations. But when he was able to speak a whole sentence, they were just so impressed. Oh, my God, you know, the guy spoke a whole sentence. It was very irritating to me, but nothing you can do about it. 